Professor Zarhova, where are you located right now? I'm located in Newcastle, uh, north of England, um, which is um, close to Carlisle and the nice uh, Unswick Castle where they showed the movie about Harry Potter. <laughs> just close to, to the all this fa fairy tale, just one hour from Newcastle. <laughs> and you are at Northumbria University, is that correct? Yes, I'm right. Northumbria University. And, and what is your official job? I'm professor of mathematics and physics. I teach um, students calculus and I teach uh, general physics, including waves. Uh, this is how um, I started teaching uh, waves in 2014, which helped me actually to understand waves better and understand what's happening on the sun. So it was a very good combination of how teaching help you in your research. So really grateful that I did it. So when you uh, finished your sort of primary education and then went on to post-secondary education, which is a term that we use here in North America, what was your objective? What did you hope to do with your career? Um, my father uh, was a very ambitious man, and I love my father very much, so he was uh, guiding me through life, and he said, I want you to be a professor. And at that time, <laughs> I got married and had a small child, so it was so distant, the perspective of professor, but I said, okay, I will, I will do PhD for you, daddy. So I started <laughs> doing PhD for my daddy and bringing up my s small child. And um, I selected PhD in um, uh, well, question solar prominences because the super, no one wanted to have a PhD student with a child. So only one woman <laughs> agreed to take me as a PhD student and she was doing this um, radiative transfer filamentary prominence I said okay I'm, I'm ready to do it let's let's do it as soon as she got me because everyone said oh you will not be working you will not do science I said believe me I'll do they didn't know that I promised my father <laughs> so I needed to do it <laughs> so where where were you what university did were you at it was um, Kiev State University in Kiev capital of Ukraine wow so I graduated okay. from Kiev but then I did PhD at uh, main solar observatory in uh, also in Kiev in Ukraine. So my supervisor was Moroshenko Nina. She's a very famous scientist in radiative transfer, and she was a very brave woman who took me as a PhD student and believed in me. <laughs> so I, I have to thank her very much. <laughs> so you completed your PhD. Where did you go from there? And, and could you speak English at that time, or were you still? Oh, well, luckily, yeah. yes. Uh, we, yeah. uh, we had a very good class and very good education at the university. We never had this um, Western university worry that the children can be tired. So they put everything on us. Whatever we can, we studied until 11 p.m. and no, no one bothered that we get tired. We have to learn, but we also were very courageous. We we wanted very curious. We wanted to learn English, and they suddenly gave us classes. Then you can study the same subject, but also in English. So I joined these classes despite having a child and everything at the university. But I love it. I learn this English lingafon courses while my son was sleeping. He speaks very good English because he, he heard two languages in his sleep. And uh, so eventually when I defended my final year project, I defended it first in Ukrainian Russian when that, and the second was in English. So I got two diploma, one diploma English um, interpreter translator and another diploma in applied math and physics. So this was, um, and uh, then it helped me very much to read the papers which were required because I could um, uh, easily read um, any papers, books, translate them. So this was very helpful. And, but we never had much chances to use language. So I did my PhD in 1980 
and until 1989 I didn't use uh, apart from reading the paper I didn't use it but in 1989 we had the first international uh, IEU symposium symposium in Kiev and I was part of the organizing committee and this is the first time I was using the language I apologize for my English and they were asking why are you apologizing I didn't know what I'm speaking I hadn't opened my mouth for 10 years I don't know but I will be speaking. So it helped me. Of course, we spoke with the accent. I still speak with the accent. But we, we know we had active vocabulary, at least in the scientific uh, environment. We knew all the methodology and everything. So it helped a lot. And then um, from 89, as you remember, Perestroika started. Suddenly they opened the bo borders and allow young scientists like me travel abroad before they did not allow people younger than 40 travel because they were afraid that they will not come back. So suddenly uh, they allowed us travel abroad and I went to the first conference in 1989 in um, Yugoslavia at that time and it was conference in Hua, island Hua, which is now Croatia. It was beautiful island. I've been after that two or three times. It's absolutely beautiful beautiful island and then I met um, many scientists the delegation from the former Soviet Union were about 15 people I was the youngest one and the closest to me next was 15 or 18 years older and up to 78 so when we arrived <laughs> to Yugoslavia to the meeting Westerners suddenly discovered a young girl speaking English they started saying do you have young scientists? I said, we have millions of them. So I explained them, but we have millions. Of, and, and do they speak English? I said, yeah, some speak, some not. But so I helped communicate with, between our group. And, and this is how I made friends uh, with uh, many solar physicists, really still friends since that time. And they started inviting me to the conferences personally because they knew that um, if they don't send me personal invitation, I will never get it because I'm too young to, to propagate it from the top to the bottom. <laughs> so this is how I started uh, getting to the conferences. And at some stage, I was curious. You go to, I went to Western Germany, to Paris, and then I spent in Medon two months and was curious how, how it is to live abroad. I never live abroad. I just came for living in the hotel is one thing and how to live as a person somewhere. So this is what I took my first postdoc. Uh, it was senior research fellow, Royal Society senior research fellow at Glasgow University with the host, uh, Professor John Brown. So I took my year and decided to, to, to live there. This is in, my first- uh, in, in Glasgow? In Glasgow, yeah. It was incredible. <laughs> That's where my family is originally from, from Glasgow. Yeah. So you can uh, possibly um, understand how shocked I was when I came to Glasgow. I, cannot, I, I can only imagine, yes. <laughs> what people say, and I thought, what the hell they think they were teaching us? They don't speak this language. <laughs> and I, I didn't realize it was different between English and Scottish until... Uh, my roommate, her boyfriend came from Petersburg and he went to Glasgow shop somewhere, came back, said, what the hell this language they speak and I can't understand them. I said, my God, you too. <laughs> so it is not me. It is not our teachers. It is different language. Yeah. So suddenly it occurred to me that people in this country speak with different uh, dialects, yes. different languages. Yeah. It, it took me about half a year to discover this because I was struggling and uh, it was uh, difficult. But then eventually it worked out. So I stayed one year, then I stayed another two years um, because my son got a scholarship at Cambridge. And obviously when he started studying at Cambridge, he was a winner of Math Olympic of the former, U former Soviet Union. This is why he got scholarship. Not because of me, it was because of himself. And um, so I had no choice. I needed to stay in the country to offer him where to spend time between studies because at Cambridge they study only six, year, six uh, months. 
and six months he needs to live somewhere else. So this somewhere else has to be my house. So this is how I stayed in Glasgow a bit longer and um, a bit longer and then in 2000 I moved to Bradford. I got permanent lectureship. But before I got permanent lectureship um, was that at was that at Northumbria University? No, it was Bradford. It is oh. um, Leeds. It is Yorkshire Dales. Oh, okay. Uh, middle, middle of, and uh, I did not um, go immediately. I worked for three years uh, as a project manager in the finance department, Glasgow City Council, because uh, Glasgow University didn't want to extend my contract, and I got. Um, uh, honorary position, keys and everything, but they didn't want to pay me, but I needed to support my son, so I went to support working, doing something else, and doing my research in my spare time in the evening. This was exactly the time when I published my first paper in Nature, when we discovered sunquakes. In 1998, published paper, which was a big um, impact. If you look 27th, 27th, 28th of May, you look at the media, there was a big impact. First time scientific um, result took all the major um, news uh, agencies. It was interesting. So only after I published this paper, it opened my way back to academia and I got my job as a lecturer in Bradford. And since then, I've worked in Bradford for 13 years and then moved to Northumbria. What does a typical day look for you uh, like these days? Because you are a professor, but you're also a researcher. Uh, a typical day depends uh, whether I'm teaching that day or not. Normally, if I'm teaching, let's say tomorrow, I need to prepare my lecture for tomorrow. Even if uh, the lecture notes are prepared, let's say, from previous year. I still need to revise for myself. I need to place them on for students on the blackboard and uh, remember where I'm doing emphasis and when I need to stop and when you do joke to wake up students and so on. So you deliver lecture, then after lectures, normally it's a couple of hours, you come, a couple of hours recovering because your brain cannot work. Lectures is like performance in the theater. You give it all. And after that, you come completely drained. You need to recharge your battery and put yourself in the thinking mode. So and after that, you can do some thinking. And normally, during the office hours, there's a lot of different administrative work. You need to produce this report. You need to produce these statistics. You need to do this. You need to do that. There is a seminar or there is a exchange or something. So normally, only after five when everyone is left, from five till seven, I can look at the screen and start thinking creatively <laughs> and put something meaningful with paper. Then I go home, have dinner, do something. And from nine to 11, again, I can put no one disturbs, everyone had meal, and I can spare some time and do some research. And the days when I don't have teaching, I do in the morning. I wake up, it's very productive time in the morning from 9 till 11. I, uh, my brain thinks very nicely. So before I go to the university, I do some research at home. I put something to everyone. If I have collaborators, I put my notes to them. So while I'm working, they are working on whatever we done and I'll then pick up the responses in the afternoon and then we can produce a paper. And more and more you're doing interviews like this. <laughs> yeah, and now I, I do also interview, try to disseminate our result and persuade that um, it is a very nice bit of uh, science and uh, Nothing dangerous is in Grand Solar Minimum. It's a natural turn of events. And the Earth came through hundreds, if not millions of them, over its life of the solar system. So if they survived, we can survive as well. If somebody's looking at you and your career path, because it's not a straight line from when you were a, a young woman 
to where you are now, what was the most important uh, intellectual uh, skill or ability that you had that led you to the position that you're in today? <laughs> I guess, again, it comes from my father. Uh, he taught me when I was little, don't cry. When I come to him, someone hit me. Come here, why, did, why do you come to me and cry? You should fight back. Don't cry and expect someone will pity you. Collect your forces and fight back. And this was a very strong lesson, which obviously I got on very young, but somehow it sits in my brain. So even if I've pushed away, as I push away from academia, I always knew that I will be fighting back. I will not be sitting and pitying myself. Oh, poor me, how could I do this? Or oh, what, what we do? No, I will be fighting. And this is fighting spirit helps you to move forward. This is what.